you some kind of god. If the girl is truly no one, she has nothing to fear. Why have you come to Winterfell? I've got a gift for you. If someone is planning on making our losses their gains, I want to hear it. And now it begins. Now it ends. What's your name? For Jacken, I think he does take a special interest in Arya, but to him it doesn't really matter who you were in real life. As soon as you enter the House of Black and White, you're under the system of the Faceless Man. So it's just another test to see how she will deal with this. What's your name? No one. <laughs> I don't believe that. He blinded her in the first place, so it's part of the game. But he thinks he's taught her a lesson, and he wants to give her another chance, and she has to go through all the tests to become the perfect faceless man. Yeah! Who are you? No one. If a girl says her name, a man will give her eyes back. A girl has no name. He's glad to see that the training's working and that she overcomes certain things that were problems at the beginning of the training. So she wouldn't give up her name or her personality and she didn't quite uh, understand what he wanted of her at first. And so this is going better and better now. Leave it. A girl is not a beggar anymore. I know I should have come sooner. I should have executed all of them. I should have pulled down the sept onto the High Sparrow's head before I let them do that to you. As you would have for me. Obviously she's pretty angry about the High Sparrow. I think there's that, I think the fact that, of course, the walk of shame that happened to her, she never thought anything like that would ever befall her and that she could always be on top. Cersei suddenly is almost a shadow of her former self. I mean, there's nothing worse than, than when people you love are in pain and hurting. And so I think we sort of meet a slightly broken Cersei and she has a strange forgiveness for him very early on in the season. I didn't want to lose you again. I understand. Common is extremely vulnerable, and on top of everything else, you know, the world has changed. The pressure is intense. She just feels, you know, out of control, which for her is the worst feeling. He raised me to be strong. And I wasn't, but I want to be. Help me. Always. She needs to believe something in all this it's a grasp but kind of holding on to a bit of sanity for her, I think. We saw Bran was the end of season four, and we knew that he was heading into a very new phase of his life, one in which he was being, being trained for something. We didn't quite know what he was being trained for, but when we first see him in the second episode of this season, we jump right in. And now we're really seeing him not only able to walk through the world, but him being able to walk through his own past and the past of his family. When we started working on the show, we did not want to do flashbacks, because oftentimes it seems like a, a hallmark of kind of lazy storytelling. But that said, you know, the history of this world is so important to understanding the world and to understanding why the characters are motivated as they are and to where they're headed. So one of the things that we really loved about this storyline with Bran is the ability to go into the past, not as a flashback, but we're seeing it from the perspective of a character that we know, and we're seeing how that character reacts to it. So it's not just us seeing Winterfell back when Ned Stark was a young boy, but also watching Bran see his father younger than he is now sparring with his own brother. And it's just, for us, became all of a sudden much more interesting and compelling. It is time to go. Please, a little longer. 
It's an amazing, enticing prospect for brand, but it's also dangerous, as the Three-Eyed Raven points out. It really needs to be doled out in doses because the temptation for brand is to never come back. You finally show me something I care about, and then you drag me away. It is beautiful beneath the sea. But if you stay too long, you'll drown. If you acquire a reputation as a mad dog, you'll be treated as a mad dog, taken out back and slaughtered for pig feed. My lords, Lady Walder has given birth. A boy. Certainly from the time that Ramsay heard that, that Roos's new wife was pregnant, he knew there was a threat to his ascendancy. And from that moment on, Ramsay knows that his position's in jeopardy because he might be a naturalized Bolton, but whatever child Roos has with Walda is going to be a natural born, you know, from, from the get-go, um, a legitimate Bolton. So that starts to make Ramsay nervous. And beyond all that, you know, one thing he certainly learned from his father is that if you have a chance to seize power, you seize it, and there's no time like the present. You'll always be my firstborn. Thank you for saying that. It means a great deal to me. It was certainly not something that was just a spur of the moment decision. In fact, we see that when we see the young Lord Karstark watching it, he's not surprised by what's happened, so he's clearly in on it. Ramsay learned certain things from his father. He certainly learned ruthlessness. The one thing about Roos, though, is that Roos planned everything very carefully, and he understood the importance of alliances. Ramsay's being a bit more incautious because the Bolton hold on the north is precarious, and much of it is due to Roos's efforts. So by assassinating Roos, Ramsay is inheriting a quite difficult job in being warden of the north in a region where many of the families despise your family and consider them traitors. I'm not asking the Lord of Light for help. I'm asking the woman who showed me that miracles exist. I never had this gift. Have you ever tried? Davos has no real love loss for Melisandre. He is not a huge fan of hers. When they were both serving Stannis, they were always the angel and the devil on Stannis's opposite shoulders. He's seen what she's capable of. He's seen her do many impossible things. He's not a big fan of her god. He's not a big fan of her program, but there's certainly nothing to lose at this point. And uh, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. For Melisandre, she comes into it with grave doubts. I mean, she was someone who was a true believer, whose faith was shaken, someone who was an absolute devotee of the Lord of Light. and. The, the events that the last many episodes have, have shaken that faith, but she still believes in him. She just doesn't know if he believes in her. And so she comes to Jon Snow's body with the tiniest hope that maybe if she says the right words, if she says them with enough belief, with enough passion, the Lord will listen to her. And Sindroro Onios, and Kir Persis, and Morgoth Gleison. Well, first, Melisandre believes she's failed, and that's what Tormund believes. I think he's the first to walk out. That's what Ed believes. And Davos finally gives up. It's it's kind of like you're applying the paddles to the, the patient who suffered cardiac arrest, and the paddles don't work. It was the last ditch thing, but we can't get a pulse back, and he's gone. And then, you know, Ghost, he's known John longer than any of these people have. And you know, all these wolves have a, a strange and deep connection with their stark counterparts. So Ghost has a kind of sixth sense when it comes to Jon Snow and when Jon's in danger and when he might be coming back. Uh.